Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Kishore Mabubani. I'm the dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, in Europe, the trains run on time. In Singapore, the talks start on time. <laughs> so welcome to this uh, debate uh, on how can old Europe and rising Asia work together. I think some of you may be puzzled because originally it was billed as a talk by Mr. Giles Merritt. And then he sent me an email saying, Kishore, I find talks to be very boring. So why don't we have a debate? Because you know, I've written some articles uh, in Europe's world that was <coughs> slightly provocative. So he said, okay, let's debate it. I said, okay, we'll be happy to, to do that. So what I'll do now, I'll just briefly introduce uh, Mr. Giles Merritt. Uh, you can get his full CV, as you know, in this open and transparent world. Let me just say he's the founder and secretary general of the Friends, in Europe, Friends of Europe, the Brussels-based think tank that focuses on high-level EU policy proposals. He's a former uh, Financial Times Brussels correspondent, uh, and he proudly said that uh, the reason why the FT has been so successful is because he used to be there. <laughs> I told him, we welcome modesty like this in Asia. <laughs> Uh, he's also been, you know, um, an author and broadcaster who was specialized in the study and analysis of EU public policy issues since 1978. In 2010, he was named one of the 30 most influential Euro stars by Financial Times, together with such other as the European Commission President Jose Mario Barroso and NATO Secretary General Andes Rasmussen. So clearly, we are, very, we are in very distinguished company today, and I'm very glad that Giles uh, suggested this uh, debate here. Now, to be fair, what I'll do is uh, I'll give him the chance to make some opening remarks for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then I'll try to respond, hopefully, equally provocatively. And actually, I do believe, frankly, that we need to have more of such debates uh, uh, in our school, because debates are often sometimes are more enlightening than, as you said, boring speeches. So, so Jas, over to you. Thank you very much for that, Kishore. And uh, thank you for agreeing to, to, a, to a debate, because let me first of all say why I'm in Singapore. I'm here to listen. I'm here to learn about the Asian century. <clears throat> I'm doing a sort of swing through uh, various Asian countries, all except China. Um, China, we, uh, we know quite a lot about already. The Asian century, I think, is in Europe more of a slogan than uh, a reality. It's, it's not part of the political thinking yet. And that's why my think tank, Friends of Europe, launched uh, a bit over a year ago an Asia program to try and first of all find out more about the Asian century but also to to feed it in and make it integral to the way uh, that uh, European policy is put together. The title of our debate I found it rather anodyne when I, I looked and thought about it, can old, I didn't like the old Europe. It was a bit Donald Rumsfeld for me. Um, uh, and rising Asia worked together. And I thought, let's go for something sexier. Let's have, are Asians counting their chickens before they're hatched? <laughs> so that's what we're going to talk about. And, and I, I, there is something to talk about here, I think. I mean. Looking at the commentators, there is a mood of triumphalism in, in Asia at the moment. And it reminds me, actually, of the, the hubris of the Europeans back at the time of enlargement and how the mighty fallen. Um, so there's triumphalism in Asia. There are also serious problems seen from a a European perspective, that the security picture doesn't look good to me. Um, and I think the political fragmentation is, is a worry. 
But we, we can come back to Asia's weaknesses, perhaps its feet of clay, uh, later. In the meantime, rising Asia is a fact. No question about it, it's a fact. And in Europe and around the world, of course, it provokes admiration and it also provokes fear because we don't know where it's taking us, we don't even know what it is. But the big question for Europe right now, of course, is how are we going to, to work with Asia? And this whole thing about using the term Asia worries me a bit. I mean, who or what is Asia? Um, if Dr. Kissinger wanted to telephone you, who, who would he call if he wanted to speak to Asia? He called you school. <laughs> <laughs> the perfect answer. <laughs> I think that, let's go back to the working together thing. The, for me, the, the key point, the key message is, and here I fear that Professor Mabubani and I are going to agree, this is a real worry, um, there's no longer any zero-sum game. The idea of winners and losers in the global economy is 20th century stuff. We're in the 21st century. We're looking at a, a globalized and globalizing economy in which we're going to have to, to tackle questions together. If there are losers, we're all going to be losers. It's not like the 20th century. I think also another key message is that looking back again at the Asian commentators, one gets the impression they say, well, Europe's finished, Europe's down, Asia's up. We better talk to the Americans they're the people to uh, they're the people to get close to, and I think this is again des desperately wrong thinking. I think that Asia has to work with both the u s and the EU, and I think you have to recognize the degree of transatlantic interdependence is so great. We are so invested in each other. We, we rely so much on one economy not rocking the boat for the other that the idea that you could somehow play Europe and, and America off against each other is wrong. A quick word. <laughs> I'm going to try and make it very quick about the European Union's problems, how bad they are. <clears throat> well, they're pretty bad. The, the Eurozone crisis is, of course, a reflection. We're going back to chickens here. Chickens always come home to roost. We lived above our means for a long time in Europe. We'd become uncompetitiveness. We still are. We fell behind on the innovation stakes. We still are behind. And we were spending more money on our social security systems and other things than we are actually producing. So we were borrowing money. And now we've got a sovereign debt crisis. My view, and I take, take some comfort from the city of London, which is unusual, is that we're going to survive. The people in the city think that there's a 20% chance that the euro will fail and an 80% chance that it'll survive. Actually, I, I would put the a percentage of survival a bit higher, but for a rather negative reason. Ten, ten years of euro-denominated debt, the idea of trying to unscramble that omelette is so horrendous that I think that uh, everybody now realizes we have no choice but to pay the bill and, and, and keep on smiling and uh, uh, fix the problem. The problem is, of course, a political one. We actually have to create the, the political union that was ducked at the Maastricht summit of 1990. 
So we actually have a, an awful lot of difficult work to do there. In my opinion, the Eurozone problem is actually a minor one. The major problem for the Europeans is structural. It is the demographic problem, the, the fact that the, the average age of Europe will, will pass the 50 mark. At the moment, it's less than 40. The average age will pass the 50 mark in about 22, 23 years' time. Um, we also have structural reform, uh, structural problems in areas like skills and education, which isn't generally recognized, but is going to be a, a serious problem in the years to come. And above all this hangs the, the problem of reform. We've got to go back to where we were 10 years ago and look at new political mechanisms sufficient to to manage a common currency and also sufficient to have a genuine single voice in world affairs. So much for Europe. I mean, we can, we can come back to Europe and talk about its, its feet of clay. It's actually got legs of clay um, uh, later. But let me talk a bit about attitudes to Europe and European attitudes to Asia. The first, I think, is you, you'd have to be deaf not to hear complaints from Asians about European arrogance and disrespect. And I think it's true. I think European politicians don't get it. They don't understand that they've got to treat Asian governments just as they do all other industrialized countries' governments. That when you have an Asian economic growth record of the sort that's being enjoyed now, you've, you've got to treat those governments accordingly. But Europeans have a, a cultural unfamiliarity with Asia. And that's not entirely the Europeans' fault. I think Asians have not been very good at actually explaining what, what's going on in Asia. I think that Asian communication has been very poor. I think that Asians really need to, to, to devote much more thought to presenting their, not their, their case, but to, to presenting themselves, showcasing themselves. I think there's a big China centricity problem. I think Europeans can see China, and not just Europeans, the whole world. Um, and uh, I think we need to be helped to, to balance the picture up more. And of course, we have a, a sort of post colonial overhang problem that is, is still real, still there. I guess the real problem with the Europeans at the moment is that, first of all, we, we are a bit ostrich-like. We do tend to put our head in the sand when things are going badly and things aren't going well, as I've said, and the future isn't particularly exciting. We're also short-sighted, where all politics is local, as they say. And we have a resurgence of nationalism in Europe. So I think these things have to be taken into account when Asians are upset by lack of respect. The Europeans are not impervious to change. And I think we're waking waking up to what I think of as the, the three S's. The first is shrinkage. I'm British. Our country is less than 1% of the global population. Europeans, as a, as a block, when I went to Brussels in the late 70s, we were 15% of the world's population. We're down to about somewhere between 6 and 7 and it's dropping. Uh, we really do need to stick together 
and to make ourselves heard with one voice. Secondly, stagnation. It takes us back to the demographic problem, in fact. Um, the, 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 the demographic bulge towards old age means we don't have enough young people coming into the labor force and that's actually creating a ceiling on growth which dropped a couple of years ago. Um, it used to be that the sort of notional limit on growth uh, created by the lack of newcomers to the labor market was a bit over 2%. It's now a bit under 2%. Um, the way forward. I think European nations, just like Asian nations, can't expect to refashion the rules for the new globalized economy. But we all understand that the old rule book, the post-war rule book, is out of date. It won't work. It's, it's inimical to the interests of emerging markets. And it's basically the industrialized countries on borrowed time. So we know we've got to change that. And I think my only real plea is that Asian countries shouldn't write off the Europeans, shouldn't try, us, try to play us off against the Americans, but should look at the great adventure of European integration, because it is a great adventure. It may not look wonderful from here, but it's fantastic what it's done to Europe, especially after the Berlin Wall came down. Look at Europe and look at the way we've developed a sort of multilateralist model and say, right, maybe the Europeans are the right people to talk to about refashioning the global rule book. And just remembering that beguiling and articulate as America is, the US Congress is a deeply domestic political body. And re getting the, the US Congress to, um, to help the emerging markets in refashioning the global rule book is going to be a damn sight more difficult than talking to us Europeans. Thanks, Kishore. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, when we were sitting in my office, Giles said, Kishore, I'm going to begin by saying, are uh, Asians counting the chickens before they're hatched? So I say, I'll respond by saying, is Europe burying itself before it is dead? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was so, a good point. <laughs> so um, I think all of you who know me uh, know that I have this terribly bad habit of making three points uh, when I speak. I can't think beyond three. So I'm going to basically speak in, in response to many of the points you raised, Giles, by saying, uh, talking firstly about the strengths of Europe Two, what I see is the weaknesses of Europe. And three, the way forward, yeah. in a sense, following your structure. Yeah. So on the strengths, and I want to emphasize from the very outset, because I think Giles knows this, I write a lot of very strong stuff, strong criticisms of Europe, but I, I, I'm not an ogre. I'm actually an admirer of Europe. And I think Europe, and I completely agree with your last point, yeah? that uh, Europe can show the way to the rest of the world in terms of how to cooperate with each other. And I can tell you your, your shining achievement, uh, which I hope that Asians will copy, by the way, is that not only, do you just, not only do you not have wars in Europe, you have zero wars in Europe, but more importantly, you have zero prospect of war in Europe. And believe me, that's an amazing achievement that Asians are still far behind it. And I hope someday we'll reach a day when we don't have to worry about the Thais and Cambodians shooting each other, yeah. <laughs> as they did a couple of years ago, or worrying about incidents uh, in the South China Sea, or even better still, if you could have a zero prospect of war between India and Pakistan, that would be a fantastic uh, achievement, you know? Yeah. But that's a sort of the end goal that Europe has created for us and for the world. 
then I think the rest of the world should copy and try to figure out why it happened. What did you do right that you created the zero uh, prospect of war? And of course, your, your open borders. Huh? As you know, when you travel in Europe, uh, once you enter Europe, you get one uh, stamp on your passport, then you can travel all around Europe. I and mean, that's a fantastic uh, achievement. And if you go north of Singapore, uh, a few miles uh, north of here, you want to cross the border, you've got to bring your passport, sign forms, and so on and so forth. So clearly, there are things that you have done in Europe that are quite amazing. And we hope that the rest of the world will eventually... I mean, if the rest of the world actually begins to look more and more like Europe, it'll look at it more and more like a very civilized uh, place. So there's a lot that we should, we can and should learn from uh, Europe. And in that sense, you're coming here uh, I think it's a, it's a very uh, positive development. But I think you want to hear more about the weaknesses than the strengths. <laughs> so let me talk about the weaknesses uh, of the European Union. And I, by the way, I agree with your analysis of the challenges facing Europe, whether it's in the Eurozone or structural reform and all that. But I think some of the problems are, 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 are deeper. And let me just suggest uh, a couple of them, a few of them. One, I think, you know, you, you, you and I discussed earlier in the office that uh, Europe now speaks with one voice, you know, uh, in many ways. But uh, in, in many ways, partly because you spend all your time, 90% of your time haggling among yourselves, you forget that, as you said, you represent 5 or 6% of the world's population. There's a 95% of the world's population you have to deal with outside. You're spending all your time looking inwards and not understanding what's happening in the rest of the world. And, there is, uh, and as a result of that, I mean, this is one of my strongest criticisms of Europe. The European Union, by and large, has become geopolitically incompetent uh, in terms of adjusting uh, to changes uh, in the world. It seems to go on on autopilot. The world keeps changing, transforming, but Europe just carries on on autopilot <coughs> as though the world hasn't changed. And so it is very difficult to create a more flexible European foreign policy that adjusts and adapts to the rest of the world because you spend all your time in internal committees uh, haggling among yourselves. By the time you worked out a common position, the world has moved on and Europe is left behind. Uh, and that happens from time to time. And to make the point even a bit tougher, uh, I would say that one of your fundamental weaknesses of Europe is that you continue to remain a kind of a geopolitical supplicant um, to the United States of America, when I think the whole rationale for being a supplicant has long disappeared with the end of the Cold War. I mean, it was, it was perfectly understandable when you faced uh, thousands of Soviet tanks uh, just uh, across your border and thousands of Russian missiles pointed at you, you say, okay, it makes sense for United, Europe to hug the United States for comfort because the United States provided you the security you couldn't provide yourself. So it made sense to be a supplicant to the United States. But the, the Cold War was over, over 20 years ago. The Russian tanks are gone. The Russian missiles are gone. Why are you still such a supplicant uh, to the United States of America? And why can't you now decide, OK, we'll create an independent uh, European foreign policy. And on areas where you disagree with the United States, uh, go ahead and disagree with the United States. I and mean, you don't have to sort of be uh, forever t uh, towing their line. And, and I think the, the biggest problem for Europe, you mentioned uh, the, the problems that Europe faces. I would say, frankly, the, the fundamental problem of being a, a geopolitical supplicant of the United States is that you live in a different geography, OK? The United States does not have 500 or 600 Muslims surrounding it. All, all around, you know? Europe does. I mean, clearly look at North Africa, the Middle East and everything. So you have to develop uh, a degree of sensitivity to the Islamic world that in some ways the United States doesn't have to because it's far away. You've got the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean protecting it. But you, know, you, don't, you swim in a different sea. And so if you swim in a different sea, you've got to sort of figure out what is it I need to do differently uh, from the United States in dealing with the Islamic world. And, and, and I, when I watch your voting in the United Nations, I was always very puzzled why the EU would always sort of try to replicate the American voting pattern when you, 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 you live in different circumstances. So I think these are the sort of fundamental questions uh, in the foreign policy arena 
that the time has come for Europe. And at the end of the day, by the way, if Europe actually pursues a more independent uh, uh, global foreign policy, it will, it will be both. It will be good, by the way, for uh, Europe. It will be good for United States. And it will be good, frankly, for the rest of the world too. You know, we're, not, we're not asking you to go against your interests. We are actually saying the European Union should look after its own interests better so that it would be a better player uh, on the world stage. Uh, and so these are the sort of weaknesses. And I, and I must say, in, in all my conversations with Europeans, I find that there's a still a very deep reluctance to confront these hard facts that you live in a new world and you've got to change your, 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 your old habits of uh, being a geopolitical supplicant. Mm -hmm. Now, then, that then brings me now to the uh, three solutions. I'm trying to leave about half an hour for q and I, I think there are lots of obvious things that uh, the Europe can do to try and improve its uh, position uh, in the world, and I'm su sort of surprised that he isn't doing it uh, more. And the fir my first point is a rather paradoxical point, which is that after complaining that the Europe has been too supplicant to American geopolitical interests, I want to suggest to you my first piece of advice is why don't you copy the United States? And if the United States announces a pivot to Asia, why don't you announce a pivot to Asia? You know? Clearly, the, 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 the pivot to Asia, by the way, is obviously an insult to Europe. You know? uh, they're saying, Europe, you know, goodbye. We, we, we loved you, but now the world has changed. We are moving to Asia, and, and, and you are carrying on hugging the United States and saying, hey, that's just, this is our future. And you don't, you're not sort of saying, hey, maybe I want to balance my, my thing. And I actually think, by the way, just this is an argument I made several times, that you, you create a much more stable geopolitical world order if you have a, what I call a balanced geopolitical triangle. Because if you look at the three major sort of global economic centers, Europe, America, and Asia, if all three parts of the triangle have equally strong links, you know, then it's a much more stable geopolitical triangle. And right now, the relations between United States and Europe are strong. United States and Asia are strong. The missing link is the link between Asia and Europe. And that's why, as you know, Singapore proposed the Asia-Europe uh, meeting and so on and so forth, to create this stable geopolitical triangle. And initially, EU embraced the Asia-Europe meeting. And then in then in the 1990s, then came along the Asian financial crisis. And the Europeans said, Asia is finished. Let's forget Asia. And you prove yourself to be fair-weather friends. You know? And so many Asians remember that the Europeans were fair-weather friends mm -hmm. in 97, 98. You know? uh, so that's one, one area where you can, you can basically do more. Secondly, you, know, you talked about global governance. And I completely agree with you. We are living in a different world. That's what my next book is about. My next book is, is, is called The Great Convergence, Asia, the West, and the Logic of One World. And I talk about how we have to live and work together in one world. Now, if you have to live and work together in one world, we have to strengthen institutions of global governance. And if you want to strengthen institutions of global governance, the best models come from Europe. Mm -hmm. And this is where Europe and Asia can be working together. And I can tell you one thing, by the way, and, and I can feel this, that many Asian leaders are actually trying to figure out how to strengthen institutions of global governance. And that's why I'm bringing out the book at this point in time, because I think there's a demand out there from people saying, what are the Asians thinking about global governance? And this is an area, frankly, where the, the natural point of view of Europeans and Asians are much closer together than the view of the United States and Asians or United States and Europe, because America still continues to rubbish the United Nations, rubbish multilateralism, when in fact, I also argue in the book, it's also in America's long-term interest to strengthen multilateralism. Sure. Uh, and that this is where, this is a fundamental common interest that Asia uh, and Europe have. And this is another area where we can work together. And finally, of course, the best thing that Europeans can do, frankly, to, to sort of have a, a stronger uh, links with Asia and develop a better understanding of Asia and develop better links with Asia is by sending more students to the Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. <laughs> <laughs> so on that... <laughs> Let's have a debate now. <laughs> I see one hand out there. Please, yes. Okay, again, if you don't mind, identify yourself and yeah. Is the mic working there? No. Hi, I'm Sweetland. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Merritt. Um, fortunately, I don't can, think can, you can really... you tell him who you are so that. Oh, yeah, sorry, solid letters. Wait, we actually met just yeah, now. Um, I don't think you sufficiently made the case for. Uh, 
or, I mean, or rather sufficiently answered the question, is Asia counting its chickens before it's hatched? Um, I understand that you wanted to speak more broadly about Asia, but it's quite impossible to talk about a rising Asia without talking about China. And uh, it's uh, difficult to look at the situation without noting the slowdown of economic uh, growth and industrial output um, that many economists are already seeing and projecting for China in the coming year. Uh, it's difficult not to comment on the domestic political turmoil that's currently ongoing uh, political transition. And thirdly, um, even in the long run, the question of whether or not China is a global hegemon or part of a multipolar world can carry off the kind of soft power that existing uh, well, comparison to the United States, for example, that the sort of cultural and social outlook of the world um, is very difficult to see that um, coming from Asia or China as a surrogate for Asia. So if, if, if you would uh, like to comment uh, on, on your chickens. Yes, I'd be very. One, sorry, one last point. Yes, Henry Kissinger can now call on Brussels when he wants to speak to Europe. Can't he? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. But who doesn't call on Beijing? That's my last Okay, um, let's let's start off with the uh, the slowdowns, and it's not just China, is it? It's India too, and I think it's rather worrying because the social needs of both these giant countries are so great, and therefore the political pressure is so strong. They need these very very high growth rates just to stand still. And the moment they start to drop, in the case of China, below 8%, in the case of India, 7 and a half, something like that, then they, 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 their, their problems accumulate very fast. And I think we're aware of this. What we're not aware of, of course, we see the Chinese economy as a great sort of profit machine. And I keep trying to explain profit machine. Profit machine. We think that because the Chinese have become such a huge exporter, that they're also rolling in money. And I keep trying to say, well, there are calculations that only about 15 cents in the export dollar actually stay in, in the Chinese economy. And the rest is the intellectual property or the, the market sort of uh, added value of the goods and the technology that arrived and the goods that then went to industrialized countries' markets. So, yes, a, the, 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 the rosy picture of straight arrow growth is very misleading, in my opinion, and it's very finely balanced, and it's finely balanced in the Singaporean economy. And yesterday I was looking out the window at the port and the man standing next to me said, thank God not too many of the cranes are upright, meaning no ship. He said, but back in 2008, 2009, he said, you could look out there and it was a forest of vertical cranes. And he, he said, I'm not sure if he got this right. He said that, this, that there was a 36% slump in the Singaporean economy for a while. It was so dependent on international trade. Um, let's go briefly. I'm, I don't want to talk about political turmoil in China because I want to see it before I talk about it. All I see at the moment is uh, uh, the, 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 the sort of rattling of of uh, sabers uh, in, in sort of behind closed doors. It doesn't seem to me to be political turmoil. What worries us much more about Asia, I think, is the security picture. And I don't like to look at the, the state within the state that is the PLA in China. I don't like to see blue navy, blue water navies being built up in China and India. I don't like what I hear from the Indians when I ask them about China's need to access resources in Africa. And I don't like the little brush fires that I see in Asia between the smaller countries like Professor Mavabani was mentioning. 
What I think we need is a security framework for Asia. And I don't think it should be American dominated. I think that the Europeans have to really awaken to their responsibilities in stabilizing the global economy. But perhaps we could come back to European defense and security shortcomings in a little while. Did you want me to come in there too? Or? Okay. I mean, the, um, I, I, I think that one of the fundamental problems is that, the, to put it very bluntly, is that the West doesn't understand Asia. And you know, think of the security dimension, for example. Okay, the it is true that there's no architecture, there's no framework, there's no logical structure, and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, if you look at it objectively, the prospects of war in this region are receding decade by decade. You know, in a very significant way compared to where the situation was 20 years ago, 10 years ago. There have been dramatic improvements in many areas across the Taiwan Straits. It's, it's almost like a love affair going on within China yeah. and Taiwan, the opening up of Myanmar. And even in the uh, difficult relationships within China and India, uh, in fact, we the school announced we've raised a $10 million endowment to do a long-term study on China and India, which is actually going to end up being quite optimistic. And uh, or even, even amazingly enough, even in India and Pakistan, there, there are signs of changes in the chemistry of their relationship. And, and, and so there, there are all kinds of positive trends that go happen under the radar screen that are not noticed. But more importantly, the way the security is improved in this region is through the, the, the magical role played by ASEAN in providing a platform for all the great powers to come together. And you can never point to any specific event or specific agreement. You can say this is what caused things to improve. But if you watch it over the years, and if you watch what happens during ASEAN meetings, after ASEAN meetings, as I keep saying, it's the weakness of ASEAN that makes everybody very comfortable. And that's why increasingly everybody wants to come to attend ASEAN meetings and everybody finds that somehow the networking in the ASEAN meetings is the way that uh, the chemistry of the region uh, changes and has changed uh, in, in, in very positive dimensions. So, you, you, and, and ASEAN, of course, takes two steps forward, one step backward. You know, there's nothing logical about it, but it seems to, you watch it decade by decade, it's sort of, gets better uh, and better. So, so if you try to say, you know, where's the structure, where's the logic, where's the you know, framework, you'll never find it. But if you look at the results, you'll find amazing enough, you get some remarkable results, and then you've got to figure out how it happened uh, subsequently. But you, you, can't, you will not find it if you try and wear the kind of Western spectacles and say, this is how I'm going to try and find it. Yeah. Next question. Please. My name is Sasha Singh, and I'm coming from a, a non-European country in the middle of Europe, so uh, Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually look at Europe a little bit from the outside and uh, have to pay the taxes for some of their uh, members living there. There is actually one point you said, is the, is the population pyramid, which is wrong in Europe, but it's also wrong in China. True. Uh, it's not wrong in India, so that's actually the, the advantage of India, at least. What you see, actually, is when you want to change this pyramid, is that you have to be open for immigration. Yes. So, in Europe, we can actually only get over this, this wrong population distribution is by opening the doors for immigration. And now you can actually think about a, a, a way to link better Asia together from, with, with Europe is we need the Asians in Europe. So we should actually start to invest in education in Asia to prepare the Asians to come to Europe to fill the gap. Because what we need is educated people. Because we don't have our own, own young, young people. One of the only countries which actually did the other way around, is Singapore. Singapore invested a lot and still does 
in bringing Americans and Europeans into Singapore. But I rarely see the Europeans or the Americans investing in Asia into the education. And so at least you have their basis, or you would have a basis for a little bit long-term cooperation <coughs> and understanding. The more Asians you have in your country, the better your country starts to understand what's going on in Asia. Uh, I don't understand why the Europeans are not open, actually, <coughs> wide opening their doors for this immigration. Yes. They fight to have not the Turks, and they fight not to have the Africans. They should actually invite, uh, invite the, uh, the Asians to come in and to prepare them. Singapore is prepared, but if you look at Laos or if you look at Cambodia or Vietnam, they need basic education to get them in. I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree more about that immigration is the only answer to the demographic problem, to labor shortages which already exist. Um, importing them from Asia, yes, I, 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 it's quite clear. Europe doesn't know enough about Asia. Asia doesn't know enough about <clears throat> Europe, and education is the only answer. I'm not sure that we need to go as far afield to 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 resolve our, our, our labor market problems. It seems to me, and this allows me to return to what Kishore was saying earlier, it seems to me we need to look around the Mediterranean basin on our own doorstep. And we need to we need to take the Arab Spring much more seriously than we have. And we need to start thinking in terms of convecting people from the Arab world and North Africa through Europe and then back again. And I'll give you the short answer to why we don't do any of these things. It's because we Europeans have an identity crisis. And you, 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 you talk to people almost anywhere in Europe nowadays, and this question of who am I? Am I a national person? Am I a European person? Am I regional or what? And the question of race are very much in the front of Europeans' minds. I mean, it's, it's very backward looking, and there's no there's no sort of excuse for it. it. It doesn't make sense in the 21st century. But it is a political reality. If you want to get elected, you better be careful about the immigration issue and what you say about it. Um, I want to, to go and touch, like Kishore, I'm, I'm a good Cartesian too. I, I like three points. Um, <laughs> My, my f the first thing you talked about was how, how much time we Europeans spend haggling with each other. Well, welcome to the real world. We need to find global consensus. If you think the Europeans have trouble finding common ground, you wait until it's a global problem. Um, what you call haggling I might call constructive politics. I might say, this is how democracies work. It's, it's laborious, it's time consuming, it's frustrating, but it's, as Winston Churchill said, it's better than any other. Um, so I, th I think that we have to recognize that revising the global rule book breathing new life into the inert form of the G20 structure is going to take an awful lot of haggling, and we're, we're all going to have to get used to that. Second point, you, 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 you talked about you know, whether or not we should just disagree with the United States and the fact that we're in a different geopolitical place. Yes, absolutely, the Arab Spring is our problem. And it's, it's illustrated the, the shortcomings of European defense.
the European defence policy has been rhetoric and no investment. And the, the result was that we needed, although the Americans didn't actually want to get their hands dirty, we needed, we needed their technology, their ground-to-air surveillance and air-to-ground air stuff. Um, we couldn't have done it without them uh, in Libya. Um, and I think that this has, this has really sounded an alarm bell for Europeans. We've got to do something about security. NATO is actually no more than a convenient uh, structure for when we and the Americans actually agree on something. Otherwise, it's frankly uh, long past its sell-by date um, and was the moment the Berlin Wall came down. We, people, people want to hang on to NATO because it's there, but I think it's actually standing in the way of a much better structure. Um, but that, that's a whole different debate. But a third point, Europeans and Asian security. What I say to, you, to, to, to Asians during this current series of visits, do you think <coughs> Europe should play a bigger role in Asian security? That the reaction has tended to be no, but out. We've, 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 we'll, we'll look after our own problems. I'm not so sure that's a good idea. I, I don't think that the American track record on uh, international security is that wonderful. Um, I don't think it, in invading other people's countries is a good idea. Uh, I think sending troops in when you don't know how to get them out is a bloody awful idea and that Afghanistan is going to be a real mess and the security problems created by the, the vacuum in that we're going to leave behind in Afghanistan is going to be nasty. And I think if Europeans want to be global actors, they have to be global actors outside the economic sphere. They have to spend money on defense, and they have to take an interest in and build security relationships with Asian governments. And I agreed with what Kishore said about so far, so good. Asian security has greatly improved, but I don't think that's a guarantee for the future. Uh, it seems to me there are still an awful lot of actors and potential pitfalls standing uh, ahead of us. And I think we Europeans should take some responsibility for making sure that global security is an improving picture, not a deteriorating one. Okay, I've got bad news for you. I agree with all your points. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, just a quick word on immigration, by the way. Yeah. If you really want to think out of the box uh, and create a better world, and believe me, it will be an amazingly uh, world in which there will be tremendously good understanding between Europe and Asia. And, you know, talking immigration, when you bring in 50 million Indians and 50 million Chinese into Europe, you get 100 million good, hardworking Asians. The EU economy will jump, and everybody will be yes. a happy. Will be a happier world. <laughs> yes, and and if they could vote, maybe maybe we could somehow use that to reverse the the, the political tendency to make immigration untouchable. Yeah. Just by the way, one quick point in India. You know, I should have mentioned to you all in case you don't know that this uh, this evening at five fifteen. The chief economic advisor, the deputy chief planner of India, is coming to speak in our school, Montek Singh Alawalia. So we will get a good picture of India this later today. So the European face of the Lee Kuan Yew School Public Policy, <laughs> Mr. Stavros. Um, John, I, yeah. I agree with your views on, on uh, European defense, but I think you were being somewhat polite in, in not really identifying the big, big problem, which is, uh, quite frankly, generally. Yeah. And, you know, in, in the 20th century, Europe struggled with uh, German militarism and the German question. We now have almost the, the exact reverse of that, which is German pacifism. Yes. And the fact that Germany refuses to um, become a normal um, yes. country in some ways and, and take the lead uh, in Europe on, uh, on defense. With, I might add, the, the tacit 
um, uh, connivance of, of the United Kingdom and, uh, and France. Yes. Um, how do we get around that uh, uh, very thorny problem given, given the history, given the sensitivities? That's a very good question, isn't it's it? It's a very dangerous question. <laughs> yeah, but, but it's, it's a good question because I mean, let, let's, you, you said I was being polite. I'll, I'll try not to be. Um, it's not just the Germans. I mean, amongst the Europeans, there are only two countries that are not free riders. The, the rest spend less and less on defense. Their armies are actually sort of social employment services. The, <laughs> the, the Europeans have two million people in uniform. Not long ago, I was at another debate, and somebody said, the Europeans have got two million people under arms. And I said, sorry, objection in uniform. Under arms is a different matter. 2% of the 2 million are actually well enough trained and equipped to be put into any sort of a 2% of... What is that? What is that? It works out to about 100,000, I think. Uh, I mean, you, you saw how strained we were with a a disengaged air war with a, a military that was basically 1960s and 1970s, Gaddafi's military, very old style. We couldn't even cope with that. Only two countries, Britain and France, have any sort of military outreach, and now they're down to one aircraft carrier between them. Their capacity to actually project power is virtually nil. Um, and it's because we're not spending money. Um, I don't know what we do about it. I think in the case of the Germans, that the, the highly controversial Paris-Berlin axis that everybody moans about, Mercosi, um, may start to make the Germans realize that they cannot be pacifists, they can't be above security, above conflict. But it takes time to, 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 to turn a, a sort of social security army <laughs> into a real army. And it would take, I think, 10 years from a standing start now for the Germans to make any useful contribution to European projection of power. Um, what, what I hope is going to happen is that um, uh, we're, 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 we're going to, to, to get real on, on defense and scrap the tanks. They're no use to anybody except for internal repression. Scrap the combat aircraft. They were bloody useless in Libya. They go too fast. Uh, spend money on surveillance, drones, and amphibious uh, operations. But this requires a huge revolution. Um, and it requires a political revolution. And first of all, you need to shoot all the generals. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. okay, please. My colleague, yeah, uh, Jeff Straussman. My name is Jeff Straussman. I'm a Hi. Uh, following up on Stavros's question and the point about immigration, I, I, I can't help but think that, that uh, you, with all due respect, and, and the team, with all due respect, uh, have essentially eliminated the self interest of nation states prematurely. And I think, uh, I think the, the, the role of Europe. Suggest that uh, you know the nation state is uh, is alive and well, and so I just want to like your perspective. In fact, the key shows as well. Do you want to go first, or should I? No, you go first. Okay. I think you're right. It's a, if you're talking about the perceived self-interest of nation states, if you're talking about 
the, the democratic structures that produce governments in nation states. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit pie in the sky to talk about Europe as a, as a sort of com as a unified, coherent actor. Um, still less of global governance, whatever that is. But when it comes down to real self-interest, not perceived self-interest, not electoral interest, am I wrong? Do we actually have different interests? Uh, I mean, different commercial interests. But countries don't compete economically, do they? It's companies. So don't our real interests become common? Do we need to find some sort of, uh, a sort of global understanding about scarce resources? Don't we need to revive the whole climate change shambles? Don't we need to see things on an international basis? Yeah, I, actually I agree with what Giles said, but also Jeff. I think what, what makes it our times so confusing nowadays is that when policymakers actually s sitting in their offices trying to write cabinet memos, trying to work out policies, and trying to, do, trying to actually figure out in their own minds, what is my national interest, you know? Uh, they, they're actually quite torn, you know? I mean, on, they, take Singapore, for example, right? And, and climate change. Frankly, in the short term, uh, it is in Singapore's national interest to fight against uh, efforts to develop an international consensus on climate change because it brings a lot of short-term costs to Singapore because we have relatively high, you know, uh, what do you call it? We have a very high carbon footprint, high CO2 emissions. So we should be working against any kind of global regime that, re that imposes constraints on states like Singapore. But at the same time, Singapore also has a long-term national interest in fighting global warming and all the dangers that come with it. So it's got to take, decide between what is short-term interest of pain and this long-term interest in making sure there's global warming. So what the Singapore government ultimately did was say, OK, we'll pay the short-term price, but go with the rest of the international consensus in fighting uh, climate change. And I know, by the way, uh, that there was a very painful debate within the Singapore government itself. And frankly, what, what you saw happening within the Singapore government, you saw happening in many, many governments in the world, trying to balance these two things. And, and, and it, there is no guarantee how they will go either way. And this is also true of large countries like China and India. You find that they too are also struggling how to find the balance between the short-term interests uh, and their, and, and their long-term interests. And in fact, this, this is why the whole, that's why we live in very confusing times because the policy makers themselves are trying to adjust their mental map to figure out how we find the right balance. Could, could I add a rider to, yeah. to that? I think, I don't know if you agree with this, that the, the, the single greatest pacifying influence in a troubled world has probably been the multinational corporation. Their interests are so widespread that they, they, they can't afford to see conflict between their, inv the, their, their sort of host countries. And at the same time, that this enormous growth in, in international trade, I think, has also made, made our common interest much greater than national interests ever were. I saw a hand over there. Please go ahead. Yeah. Wasn't there another lady there who raised her hand? No. May I? Great, great, great. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Shunpei Watanabe. I'm a student here at uh, MPB program from uh, as, uh, also from University of Tokyo and also a uh, representative of uh, Japanese gangs in the school. And, uh, and uh, I have a question. Um, you know, it's, um, you know, Europe, I mean, it would be great if Europe and Asia can work together in, in, a, in a more closer relationship, but it's just too far. I mean, if you 
look at the map, I mean, Atlantic Central map, Asia is in the end of the world. And I, I, I spent a year in Holland, and my, the difficulty I had is that, you know, when they know sushi and they, when they have eaten sushi, that's where their mind stops about Japan. You know, it's, it's very difficult to get them beyond um, getting interested in sushi. So, I mean, so, I mean, so the wall of sushi is quite persistent. I, I can tell you that. So, um, how, how can you get these um, uh, geographically distant regions together? And how, and this, this will probably go to the dean, but how, how would Asia engage in Europe? I mean, you can't just crop out the Middle East and, you know, uh, put these together. So um, how, how would you uh, overcome this distance? I mean, that, that, that is one of the fundamental problems, I believe. Thank you very much. I've got news for you. The map is changing. The polar route now makes the shipment time between Yokohama and Antwerp less than eight days. We're looking at a very different world. I mean, the cultural difference is Yes, they're going to take ages to break down. But the physical change in trade, in the movement of people, is accelerating. More and more people, I mean, look at the forecast for air travel. The, the number of people who are going to be moving around the world, the speed with which goods will go from Asia to Europe and Europe to Asia, is, I think, going to change all that thinking. So I think the sushi thing, nice as it is, is going to be overtaken by reality. Yeah, I, I agree with Charles. And by the way, incidentally, I'm told the number one Sunday dish used to be fish and chips in UK. Now it's chicken tikka. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, I mean, that's an indication of how Asians, uh, you know, are everywhere nowadays. I, I th actually, I think... You know, by the way, I, I do, I, one of the interesting things I have in, in my next book is statistics on air travel, by the way. Uh, and it's amazing. The flow of air travel is like this, you know, yeah. around the world. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, about a to total population of 7 billion, close to 1 billion are beginning to travel across international borders. Yeah. It's one in seven, you know. Yeah. And, and my answer to you, Watanabe-san, is that the, it's the young people who actually are now far more mobile than their parents' generation. And you read stories of young Spanish who obviously can't get jobs in Spain, as you know. 50% of Spanish youth are unemployed. Will then pack up their bags and go to, uh, you know, all kinds of parts, different parts of the world. So the, the mobility uh, of people has grown by leaps and bounds. And I think at the end of the day, frankly, that the differences actually 10 years from now, 20 years from now, will seem much less because when you go to a restaurant and you sit down, you actually find you, uh, you, uh, you end up ordering exactly the same kind of food, whether it's uh, sushi or chicken tikka or uh, siu mai or whatever. Or fish and chips. Or fish and chips. No, maybe not fish and chips. Come on, please. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, next question. <laughs> I see two hands. Yes, a lady over there and a gentleman at the back, yeah. Yes. Hi, I'm Nirmali. I'm an MPP junior. Uh, my question is related to what uh, Dean Kishore mentioned earlier about um, climate change and the fact that we, uh, I think you know, we, we're overspending and we need to come to an agreement that probably in the future we can't grow forever, that we have to, like there's going to be negative growth rates in the long run. Is this something that Europe and Asia uh, is recognizing? Um, and when we talk about rising Asia, I guess we're thinking increases in GDP, but then perhaps that's, that's not possible in the long run. So how are, they, are these uh, regions considering that fact, and how are we going to work together um, in that light? Are we assuming that we're going to continue growing? Um, I'm sorry if it's a bit... These are I haven't quite understood... So you're talking about overspending on climate change, or no, 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 no. Uh, just no, no, no. overspending consumption, economy, consumption. consumption. Uh, well, 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 I guess with the surge in Asian consumption, cars, refrigerators, and so on and so forth, will that lead to more global warming? And what do we do about it? 
Simple. Europeans should consume less. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Are they considering that in their in, in policy making? Well, let's start with the Americans, shall we? <laughs> Okay, uh, the answer is Europe and Asia will gang up on America. <laughs> no, I mean, you've, 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 you've hit the nail on the head, haven't you? Um, Nine billion tomorrow, but that's actually the lower fork of the UN forecast. The higher one is ten and a half. And there's a lot of disagreement about whether global population plateaus mid-century or keeps on climbing to the end of the century and hits the 12 billion mark. How are we going to cope with these guys? How are we going to channel consumption into investment? I don't know, and I haven't met anybody yet who does. We muddle through. It's the human condition. On the other hand, I think that these are questions, I mean, as Kishore said, I used to be a journalist. Even for the Financial Times, it's difficult to get people to focus on big picture problems. People, it, we're back to politics is local. Politics is theatre. Theatre means actors, characters. So people focus on the little stuff and they don't look at the big problem that's heading their way. And I, I don't know how we get people to focus on it. I mean, the only uh, comfort I would draw from it is, although it's a bit on-off, the climate change issue has grabbed public opinion in a quite remarkable way. It hasn't actually mobilized political action. We haven't actually decided who should pay what for it. but. That said, in the space of 15, 20 years at most, global opinion focused on climate change. It hasn't yet focused on the, the, the consumption versus investment and the, the population explosion problems. Thank you. My name is Yuran. I'm a, a public policy student here. You know, my question is... Um, Tell telling what country you're from. So you... Okay, it's a very remote country in the heart of Central Asia called Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzia. Yeah. yeah. So, um, well, thank you for raising interesting points, Mr. Merit. Uh, you know, my question is, um, you know, I used to think Europe uh, did things quite differently and maybe better in some respects as opposed to the U.S. But after the events in Libya, um, I've become a bit skeptical. Um, and, you know, I wonder if Europe is becoming a, a, a more like a war entrepreneurial entity at the end. The way it did things in Libya was in defiance, I think, of every international norm. Um, had this Gaddafi, no matter how bad he was, killed, you know, they, they, Europe, if not the US, or Europe could have arranged his transfer to uh, the court in Hague, you know, and follow all these uh, norms. Hi. Right. Thanks. I agree with you. Can I, can I go? Um, I, I agree with you, and, and I, I, I have a split personality on this, a sort of... Uh, um, as a Brit. As a Brit. <laughs> no, no, as, as somebody who first of all thinks that you can't have security without the ability to, to enforce security, to, whether it's just for peacekeeping, you need to have military outreach. But... I, I don't really like, and I, here I agree with you, Kishore, that, you know, the relationship with the Americans has been yes, sir, no, sir, three bags full, sir. Um, I don't think that invading other people's countries is a very good idea. I think the Iraq adventure was disastrous. Um, I think that the Libyan thing is wrong and that we, we haven't yet seen the, the price we're going to have to pay but it's clear we didn't understand the, the sort of patchwork of different interests in Libya, and we didn't think at all about what sort of governing structures we, we could be put in place. And the only good news was that you didn't have any soldiers, so we now have to get out. Uh, but we may have to put them in to, to keep order. That's still 
uh, lies ahead. So I think invading other people's countries is a very misguided idea. And uh, I, I never approved of the Afghanistan uh, adventure. I think it's a wrong way to go about stabilizing such a, a sort of central part of the world. Um, what, where we go from here, I don't know, because public opinion, rather than political choice, seems to determine uh, a lot of these foreign adventures. Um, and we're, we're looking at the same thing in Syria. Uh, you, you can already sense a build-up of public opinion, certainly in Western Europe, that we've got to do something. These poor people are being shelled by their own troops. We've got to do something, and it's, 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 it's human, it's inhuman not to intervene. And we're going to see a lot more of this in the Arab world, I fear. And I don't know what, what we do. Um, I think that the, the Europeans are less bellicose than the Americans. I, I, th I think that Bob Kagan was right about Americans from Mars and Europeans from Venus or whatever the hell it was. Um, but it's also a question of taking responsibility for your own neighborhood. And to some extent, we're going to be sucked into, in, into adventures in other people's countries because Europe is the sort of hegemon for the Mediterranean basin. We have one minute, so can you ask a very short, sharp question and he'll give an equally brilliant, short, sharp reply. Uh, my name is Sanjan, I'm uh, an MPP junior student. If Germany is uh, currently a de facto leader for Europe given the current crisis and have been one of the major players in, Euro in the European project, who do you believe are the, the Asian strategic actors, the countries or the leaders that uh, the European Union will be looking at in the next 25 to 50 years? Which countries, which city-states, nations, which individuals could they be looking at uh, as strategic partners uh, in the near future or in the distant future? Even? I haven't got it, do I? Within Europe, who, uh, who are the people that we should be focusing on? Because you say... Who can Europe look to in Asia as strategic partners? Because if the European Union is a cohesive unit and Germany can be the de facto leader to some extent for the outsiders to look at the European Union, Asia doesn't have that unified body that you could go to. You couldn't call a Brussels in Asia and talk to Asia as such. There isn't a unified body to represent Asia. So who would be the st strategic partners in, uh, in Asia? Okay. Let's put India and China to one side because it's kind of obvious. I think Indonesia, and I think that um, very small but sort of intellectually active countries, Singapore comes, comes to mind, are also going to be influential. I think that the, the, the short answer I would give to this, and I hope this is true, is that the one lesson you can draw from the European experiment despite the Berlin-Paris axis, is that size doesn't matter all that much. That you still get, um, you get to have your say, and you get to exert uh, influence, even if you're a small EU country. The political mechanism allows it. And I hope that that's going to be true of the way we look at Asia, that we listen to the smaller, but sort of intelligent voices as much as we do to the sort of great big club carrying giants. Well, Giles, we come to 1.30. I hope that you are all not very disappointed. I mean, you may have expected fireworks between yeah, well, Europe and Asia, what's all this and you agreement? ended up agreeing with so much, you know. So I guess all this means good news for the world, you see. It means that Europe and Asia are going to fall in love all over again. And the world will be a happy place thanks to your visit to our school. So thank you, Charles. Thank you very much.